welcome to the next Europe Direct Blanchardstown podcast. This is part of our series on mental health, which is linked to the EU strategy on mental health. Um, once again, I'm joined with psychotherapist Amber Roach. Amber, you're very welcome. Thanks, Barry. Pleasure to be here. Yep. Yeah. And this time now, in our last one, we spoke about ADHD in some detail in a mental health context. So we're, we're kind of staying with the neuro, neurodivergent theme um, in this podcast. And we're going to talk about autism in a mental health context and mental health for people with autism, but also for, say, the parents of a child with autism. Um, and in the library, we, we have really stepped up our game in recent years on catering uh, to people with autism. As I said, we, we have lots of facilities that I'll go into maybe a little bit later. But uh, let's get started. So the first question is a very simple one, Amber. What exactly is autism? Barry, autism spectrum disorder or ASD, it's a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition mm. and it impacts how a person experiences the world around them. It affects how the individual thinks, how they feel, how they experience their environment and also how they interact and communicate with others. Right. So as you say, it's it's experiencing the world in a slightly different way. And maybe I think you've mentioned this before with ADHD, that you might just think in a slightly different way to, to, to other people. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, oh, we'll go into that um, in a little bit, bit yeah. more detail as okay. we go through the discussion. Perfect. So, so the next question I want to ask is, um, what, what are some of the difficulties somebody with autism might face? So typically people with autism, they experience differences in the way they communicate and interact socially. So we often see behavior that may be repetitive mm -hmm. or highly focused. Um, individuals with autism also tend to experience differences with their senses and that can affect the way they feel about and respond to their surroundings. Okay. Okay. So... We've got a definition of autism. We 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 know some of the difficulties that people face. Um, there's a term that I've heard quite a bit, and I don't fully understand it, and that's the autism spectrum. So what do we mean by the autism spectrum? Yeah, that's a good question, Barry. So every individual with autism is different, and autism is known as a spectrum disorder mm -hmm. because Spectrum refers to the wide range of characteristics, skills and abilities that individual with, individuals with autism have. So every person's experience with autism is different and they themselves will have different support needs. Mm. So although the core characteristics of autism can cause a range of challenges, Individuals with autism also have unique strengths, skills, and capabilities. And autism, again, you, there, there are different levels. So people may have um, or be categorized as being very high functioning. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are, are individuals who have a lot more difficulties. Okay, so hence the, the spectrum there that you could be on a different yes, path and start exactly. high functioning to, yeah. And mm. something's really interesting you mentioned, I'm really glad you said this, you, you kind of spoke about the strengths of people with autism as well. To, so th there's obviously challenges there, as you said, but there's also mm. strengths. Yeah. And could you just talk a little bit about those strengths and challenges? Sure. So when we talk about autism, Barry, we tend to focus a lot on the challenges that autistic mm -hmm. people face. And sometimes we disregard the strengths, which is really unfair. We need to look at both the strengths and the challenges when assessing someone's needs. And often a strength based support could help. Okay. So many autistic people have strengths and abilities and interests that non autistic people um have so everyone's different but some of the strengths that autistic people have are um attention to detail okay so we'll see that quite a lot so they've really got an eye 
for for things. Um, and then another one would be visual perception. A lot of autistic people are also very creative mm. and have a lot of artistic talents. They can be really mathematical and good um, at technical things. Um, so often they'll have an interest or expertise in niche areas. Mm -hmm. The character strengths are a lot, a lot of autistic individuals. They're very honest. Mm -hmm. um, they'll say it as it is mm -hmm. and very loyal. Okay. So really loyal friends. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you're focusing on the positives there and the strengths because we, we have a tendency with things like autism or ADHD and, and other issues to kind of see them in very much so a negative light. And I think I said this about ADHD as well, uh, where, where somebody described it, autism is my, is my superpower. And I think yes, that's a great that's way a to see one. it. Isn't yeah. it a great way? And, and, and Yeah, and you mentioned the strengths there and, and some of them are so so important this attention the detail the ability to focus in on on very niche interests i i had a university lecture um with, with autism and and but had just an encyclopedic knowledge of the area they were in and they they said to us that it was my autism that gave me the ability to do this to have this level of focus not not that prevented me it gave me the ability and i think that's a brilliant way of looking at it uh, yes, you know, I remember seeing. Yeah, I remember seeing a documentary where, um, in Silicon Valley in in uh, California, I think it is, employers there were looking specifically to employ individuals with autism because of that high level um attention to detail mm -hmm. and strong interests, particularly yeah. in technical fields, mm -hmm. um and. I know with my own son who has autism, he has a really keen interest in computers and yeah. um, technology, that kind of thing, gaming, and from a very young age. So I could ask him anything around that IT area and mm. he'd be able to assist me. Yeah, and there's, there's probably some, as you say, especially in IT technology, there's probably some particular professional areas that would be really, really suited uh, to people with autism and as you said there you have a company actually looking for people with autism and, and again that's it's great to see that that's it's it's seen as a strength um you know and it's it's great that we're moving away from this feeling of 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 autism or adhd or any neurodivergent type of um thinking that it's, it's not a negative thing it has it has yes. strength so that that's brilliant so i want to move on uh, if you could tell me a little bit about your your professional experience with autism and also some of your personal experience uh, with autism. Sure. So, Barry, I previously worked in the area of disability for over 10 years. Okay. And during that time, I supported many people with various disabilities and various levels of disability, including autism, amongst other disabilities. I also did um, some further training with the late Dr. Alan Corbett, who was a psychoanalyst and um, a specialist in the area of disability and psychotherapy. Okay. And he was a formal, uh, former director of Respond in the UK. So this was after my own training as in psychotherapy and counselling that I began to specialise in that area also. Okay. So it really, I was really interested in the area. And then my own son was diagnosed with autism nine years ago. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and so nine years ago, so how old is he now? He's 13 now. 13, so teenager. Yeah. And, and when did you begin to suspect that there was something maybe different about the way he, he thought or functioned or was it quite young or was it later on it was he was very young um so he's my second child right and i guess you notice things a little bit more um with your second okay so for me it, i began to notice differences or i think i suppose i became a little bit alarmed 
um, when he was, would he would have even been maybe about three months old. Right. And when he was in his cot, I noticed him twitching a lot. And then his eyes would often move from side to side. Okay. So I thought, oh, maybe there's some kind of um, epilepsy there. Because it almost looked like he was having some kind of mini seizures. Okay. So I initially started that process of, you know, talking to the, my GP about that. And he, they kind of like passed it off. But as he began to get a little bit, you know, a little bit older and he wasn't really hitting those developmental stages. Yeah. Such as crawling, um, walking those kind of things mm -hmm. so that he you know they, he was slow on them um and i also noticed when he was beginning to wean himself and beginning to eat with a spoon he'd mm. often take the spoon up in the air and he'd be looking at it really intensely mm. so again i began to push a little bit more and um what happened was they did test him out for epilepsy and that came back negative so that in itself was a relief mm -hmm. but what began then barry was a series of consultations with a whole host of doctors and consultants with me just knowing something was off but people really not believing yeah that's a big um, problem i had a fantastic uh nurse at the time um who visited you know, every so many months just to check on his development. Mm -hmm. And she noticed things I was noticing, um, particularly, you know, the crawling, things like that weren't happening. So his milestones weren't happening. And then when he, he did begin to walk, he was walking on his tip, tippy toes. Mm. So again, this raised concerns for me. And he was then referred to an orthopedic surgeon uh, of all things right. when typically um children with autism will walk on their tippy toes okay so when i look back and I, I think how the hell was that missed mm. um then he would often um, flap so he'd make these arm movements when he was looking at things that you know let's say telly tubbies or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that barney on yeah. on telly something that he got really excited about okay so this arm movement would happen again that was another trait okay. of autism so of course as you do you begin to look on dr google and and mm. i started seeing all these things and i guess i became very scared yeah. because what we hear and see about autism is often very negative yes yeah and you know, the media doesn't often portray autistic people in a positive light. Mm -hmm. And we're shown these, you know, symptoms that are completely exasperated or individuals who have very stuck lives. Mm -hmm. So I became very fearful as a pa parent. And then I suppose the big indicator was his speech. Okay. So he was very slow at speaking and he then began to engage in what's called echolalia which is when the person repeats what you say mm -hmm. um so their 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 comprehension of language is very poor mm -hmm. so they'll copy okay. what a person is saying without necessarily understanding it right so we then started off on the path of um speech therapy mm -hmm. And then we were referred for um, a, an assessment. And at the time, this is going back, I would say, probably about nine years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. We went for an assessment and what I can only describe as being archaic. archaic. Really? That's how I would describe it, Barry. Wow. Um, the paediatrician seemed to appear to be completely clueless. Mm. referred to a textbook that probably was from the 50s oh my god um where they solely concentrated on a child's ability to give eye contact 
right. um, which is not the case. No. Aut autistic people can find it difficult to maintain eye contact, but that isn't always an indicator. Mm. So it was really disappointing because me as a mother, I knew my own child yes. and I trusted my own instinct. Also, I'd worked in the field of disability. Mm -hmm. So there were things that I recognized in my own child yes. that I had seen in other children. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, it's a, it was a really lengthy battle. And then we were put on um, a wait list for further assessment. Mm -hmm. But what happened then, Barry, is between then... And now um, my family uh, migrated to Australia right? and we chose Perth, particularly because we knew the services there mm. were outstanding. Right. And it was a, a big risk leaving everything. But I knew myself it was probably going to be a game changer for my son. Yeah. And literally within landing in Australia, we were automatically put on a system. Mm -hmm. And by the time my son was three and a half, we had a diagnosis of autism. Right. right. That's that's really powerful. What you've said, that really is. And I'd, I'd say there's a lot of parents will identify with that. And, and you're so right. You said something as a mother, you know. You know more than anyone. As a mother, you know. Yeah. And, of course, because there was nothing physically different in my son, mm -hmm. people would say things like, oh, sure, there's nothing wrong with him. Yeah. But yeah. you're right. There's nothing wrong with him. There's everything right with him. Mm -hmm. He's just different. He's neurodivergent. Yeah. However, yeah. it was almost like as if he had to have, you know, something really really abnormally physically yes. wrong with him yeah. or people would take me serious so I felt almost like I was a neurotic mother mm. what I would say to any parent out there is you know your child yeah trust your instinct yeah and keep pushing until you get the answers mm -hmm. I was in a very lucky position that I moved to a country where the they were streets ahead mm -hmm. with services yeah. And also um, with research as well. Mm, yeah. And the research indicates that early intervention is key. Yes. And, and I know and your son is doing really well now. He's 13. He's, he's fantastic. doing fantastically. Fantastic. So initially he went to um, kindergarten where they specialized in speech therapy. Okay. But once he got the diagnosis, he could no longer stay there. So he needed to move into mainstream. Mm -hmm. Um and he was in mainstream but was struggling. Okay. So we then got the opportunity to put him into a program that specialized in um providing education for children with high functioning autism. Okay. Okay. which is what Aaron had. Right. So this was quite a specialized program. And again, what I would say is that because autism is a spectrum, the, the supports need to be at the level that the child is at, at that particular time. Yes. Because it will change. And it certainly changes when the interventions are put in place. Okay. So for us, it was like winning the lottery. Yeah. And he received an education that was very specific, very supported and very specialized. And he was in that particular unit for, I think, probably about four years. Mm -hmm. And then prior to him going into high school, so his last year of primary, mm -hmm. essentially, we were told, look, he actually doesn't need to be in this unit anymore. We're going to transition him into mainstream. Okay. Which is what happened. So yeah. for his last year of primary, he was fully mainstreamed. Mm -hmm. And now he's in high school and fully mainstreamed. He has um, a um, support person when he needs it, if and okay. when he needs it. Yeah. Uh, so special needs teachers in the classroom 
Mm. But most of the time, he he himself doesn't want it. Okay. He doesn't want to be seen as different to anybody else. Yeah. Um. So he's very much in charge of his own education in a sense of mm -hmm. when he receives support. But I think what I'm trying to say there, Barry, is that once supports are put in place, mm -hmm. the, the individual can reach those developmental milestones yeah. and can transgress through life and live mm -hmm. a happy, fully functioning life. Yeah. Um, and on that note, what I would say to parents is that don't hide behind, don't hide that you, in a sense, you're doing your child an injustice mm -hmm. if you don't find this or if you don't try yeah. and get support. Yeah. Some parents um, I've come across, they've said to me, well, I don't want to label on my child yeah and I agree with that you know my son is who he is mm -hmm. he also deals with autism and that's yeah. the reality of it yeah. but that's not However, his whole personality it's, that's it's, it's not part of it personality. yes exactly and unfortunately I know of um parents who didn't want to go down mm. that route of of getting the diagnosis or because of the label thing. However, the child missed out on the supports. Yes. And now there's huge gaps in yeah. where yeah. these children are at. Yeah. And um, so early intervention is so important. That, that was so interesting and powerful, I have to say. Um, and I just want to go back to that point about a parent knowing, especially a mother. I mean, in my case, I, I was born quite premature. I was about two months early and my mother knew something was up. She knew, she mm -hmm. just knew something was up and went to the hospital and was kind of fobbed off at first. Oh, you're fine. And she, like you said, she stuck at it. I said, no, there's something not right here. I need you to check it. And they did. And they, they whipped me out of there pretty much straight away. Uh, I wasn't the, the, um, I, I wasn't being fed basically is what, what had happened. Um, the umbilical cord had collapsed, and and but she knew uh -huh. something was up, and 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 like you say as well with your child, you know, you know when something is different when the, when those milestones yes. aren't being hit, and uh, you know, and when I hear about your, you know, the, the support you got in in Australia, yeah, it's it's probably true. We've a lot of work to do in Ireland to catch up, in, in that area. I know schools are are trying their best, and there's a lot of them putting in autism units. I know the library we're, we're doing what we can. We have the uh, not so different uh, organisation with Deirdre Lynch in the same Lynn building, uh, which deals with young people, kind of older teenagers to young adults, and they yes. they do superb work dear lynch i've chatted to several times her herself is neurodivergent and um, she does superb work so i mean that that's a, another resource we have in the dublin 15 area at least um okay i'm going to move on from that um as you said we we've spoken already about mental health issues in general but with autism there can be some very specific mental health issues faced by people with autism so could you talk about that a little bit yes so autism is not in itself a mental health problem or an intellectual disability but some people with autism will also have those conditions mm. and current evidence reports that around 50 to 80 percent of autistic people also experience mental health conditions okay there's also emerging evidence to suggest that autistic women and girls experience higher rates of mental health illness okay. than compared to autistic men and boys. Mm. So some of the common mental health conditions experienced by autistic people include depression, anxiety disorders, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. So these facts highlight the urgent need for mental health services and resources that are designed for and with autistic people. 
Yeah, and like and as I just said, it, it it really does highlight it. And there is actually an EU charter for the rights of people with autism, um, which which is quite an interesting one. And and it just shows the importance of of that we need to get those supports really improved in this country yes. um, and the resources put there. Just can I just go back to something you said there? You mentioned about girls and, and women. Do boys tend to get diagnosed more frequently than girls when it comes to autism? They do, yes. And again, it comes down to the masking as well. Okay. So boys um will typically display those traits um more we can see them more easily with boys. Mm-hmm. And girls get generally left behind in the diagnosis, okay. but also there is a larger number, a larger percentage of boys um, who have autism. Okay, that's that's um, interesting because when we spoke about ADHD, it was a similar situation, wasn't it? Again, less yes. girls tended to get diagnosed, so that that's an issue that needs to be to be looked at. Yeah. yeah, without without a doubt. Um, so. I mean, we talked, you said what 50 to 80 percent of people with autism will suffer other or or, or should I say will suffer mental health disorders, autism not being a mental health disorder in itself, but things like anxiety, depression, stress, that type of thing. So what what are the barriers that make it harder for autistic people to get the, the right kind of and targeted mental health care? There are many barriers that make it more difficult for autistic people to get that the right mental health care and these can include low autism awareness and understanding by mental health practitioners so also there can be communication difficulties particularly when the autistic person is Mm non-verbal and also there's sensory sensitivities and then generally a lack of coordination and collaboration between mental health, mainstream health, disability services and other sectors, also including education, employment, justice mm. and housing. There are all a lot of barriers there. Right. Yeah. And, well, and just, again, on, yeah. Barry, poor, yeah, poor autism understanding can lead to healthcare professionals assessing an autistic person's mental health concerns just as simply part of their autism uh, yeah and when this happens the individual's mental health issues are often not properly diagnosed mm. or treated mm. and that can result in poor outcomes for their health and well-being autistic individuals like any other citizen have the right to access mental health health services and to feel safe in doing so. Yeah, as we said, the, the, the charter for the rights of people with autism. And, and as, as again, what struck me there, as you said about maybe being dismissed, oh, that's just part of the autism, but it's not. No, I actually have, a, you know, a struggle with anxiety. I just happen to have autism too. And maybe that makes yes. it a little more difficult to, to deal with. But, you know, this is this is an issue in and of itself, the anxiety or the depression. Um, it's too easy, I suppose, to kind of lump it together and... It is, you yeah. Know. That's what tends to happen. And and is it possible for somebody with autism to also have, say, ADHD or dyslexia or dyspraxia or something like that? Is that? It yeah. There's a lot of comorbidity. My son, he has ADHD as well, okay. and um, also dyspraxia. So right. the, yes, the, a lot of them come hand in hand. So it's quite common, yeah. Which, which obviously, you know, is is difficult when you're dealing with multiple uh, it is. issues, yes. yeah. And I'm sure some of them are missed. Again, they'd probably say, "Oh, that's just part of the the autism." Whereas, no, the the dyslexia may be an issue in itself. Um, yeah. So it's a very tiered approach when working with a, a person with autism. Okay, so we we've we've covered in a bit of detail there mental health for people with autism but the next group of people I want to speak about are the parents of people uh, with autism or or maybe another uh, neurodivergent thing such as ADHD but in particular autism and I know those parents themselves will often face mental health difficulties I, I did a course I did a I was organizing a 
a, a talk with a psychotherapist called Fiona Hall a few years ago, who herself has a child with autism. And she gave a talk for parents of a child with a diagnosis. And I, I've never seen anything like it. It was the most intense uh, talk I've ever been at. Um, the emotions were very high. Um, a lot of parents were in there meeting other parents in a similar situation yes. for the first time ever. I spent a lot of time getting tissues and water for people. And it, it was a very emotional uh, hour and a half. And it just struck me how the, the toll on the mental health of parents must be. So could you speak a little bit about some of the uh, the mental health difficulties faced by a parent of a child with a diagnosis such as autism? Sure. So, Barry, as you said, it's a really emotive topic and it's it can be such a journey for a parent to initially get that diagnosis and then also all the grief that comes with that as well um, mm. and and acceptance yeah but as a parent of a child with autism it's so important to look after your own mental health mm. and research has found that parents who are primary carers of a child with ASD they're often found to experience higher levels of stress and poor physical health when compared to with parents of children of typical development. Okay, okay. Well, and, and what are some of the mental health concerns that you're talking about here, this group of parents? What are the, would they be specifically? Okay, so parents of autistic children will often report that they experience more depression, anxiety, and stress-related health problems than other parents. So parental stress has also been associated with marital stress. Okay and less effective parenting. Mm. Now, one of the things is also sleep. So as we know, um, with babies or toddlers, you know, the lack of sleep really impacts us. But often children with autism will have lifelong sleep problems. So that leads to enormous difficulty. Myself, um, as a parent, my of an autistic child my son has always had sleep problems and still to this day he's 13 and you know he, I'll have a lot of difficulties trying to get him to sleep or him actually coming in and waking me up in the middle of the night so it's ongoing so you yeah. really really need to look after yourself um, and yeah. also the, the cost of treatments is huge yes. on parents particularly when there's no funding for yeah. assessments and um, assessments are really costly so if it's a family that are trying to raise that kind of money to get the um the, the assessment in itself and then to get the support such as occupational therapy physiotherapy speech therapy if, mm. if there's no funding there that that's huge yeah. So there's so much stress. The financial burden can really hit families hard. Yeah. And yeah. then also we have to look at the presence of challenging behavior. Mm. And that can contribute to more parental stress and huge amounts of disruption in the family. Um, and particularly if there's other children in the family. Yeah. So it can cause a lot of sibling rivalry. Right. right. And parents can feel really stretched and pulled mm -hmm. between the different children in the household. Yeah. But uh, as um parents, it's also to trying to keep your relationship afloat mm -hmm. as well and making time for your partner. Yeah, which is in challenging all of that. It was challenging with anyone with children that's a challenge so it's it's an extra yes. a challenge and just in, in that that event I spoke to you about a lot of the parents spoke about feeling guilt and um, often towards their other children yeah. who, who they felt oh, I'm yeah. not giving enough time to my other children because I have to focus so many of my energies here and I, I felt really really felt for the people because you could see the pain there um, yeah of course all that guilt um, and then, of course, then the other children can sometimes act out as well yes. because yeah. they're not getting the attention that they need. 
-hmm. but it's hard because you're trying to pull yourself in every direction and trying to be the best to everybody Mm. but what i would say is you have to be the best to yourself as well yeah yeah you can't pour from an empty cup yeah, and you're as you often say, you're no use to anyone if you haven't looked after yourself. Which kind of leads me to the next question. Yes. So, the, uh, parents of kids with autism, and, and I think the research bears this out, they definitely do experience higher stress uh, than most parents, which which is stressful enough as it is. Um, so how can these parents and caregivers of of children with autism? What can they do to cope better to mind that mental health? So it makes sense that effective treatment can mitigate some of the parental stress experienced by these families, particularly those whose children struggle with communication and challenging behaviour. Numerous studies suggest the effects of challenging behaviour, such as aggression and defiance. Mm -hmm. So that on the family system, they're major factors in parenting stress. Okay. So... Trying to find interventions that support your child's communication, assist them in accessing medical services. Um, They'll arm you with behavior management tools Mm -hmm. and those tools lower distress in both the child and the parents. That's interesting. Just saying that that, that, because you were talking about like minding yourself is also getting the, as you said a, a good few minutes ago, people who are maybe reluctant to even get a diagnosis but getting that diagnosis and the right supports can also transform your mental health or help your mental health too which is so important of course yes so reducing challenging behaviors can also help you avoid the social stigma yeah. and feelings of exclusion and isolation that many parents report so you know often you can find that your kid might not get invited to parties or you know relatives might make past remarks on the child's behavior Mm. and you as a parent then feel ashamed or feel i'm not being a good parent or you know why is this happening why is my child being isolated so it's really hard but if you can get some supports in that support that challenge in behavior you can mm-hmm. see differences and changes. Yeah. Um, and it just, it's educating yourself as well. And that really helps. Um, and then for parents of children with autism, whoever your child socializes with, it's important that the relationships are based on acceptance mm. and understanding. Yeah. But also that your own friendships are based on acceptance and understanding. Yeah that your family or or friends, they understand where you're at Mm. and to be as supportive and kind uh, with you as they can. And it makes a huge difference. And I think, can I just say some of the, like to go on with that, like you mentioned being judged earlier as a a big thing. And sometimes if a child with autism is Mm. acting out in a particular way, it it could be from overstimulus or or, or something like that. And they're not, being bold no they're, they're just they're struggling to, to 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 maybe process the stimuli maybe i'm getting this wrong you can correct me on that it's no, it's not you're, boldness you're right. it's 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 like a genuine struggle to to handle certain stimulus and you need that understanding from the people around you yes i now i, I suppose i can spot the autistic meltdown a mile away mm. in the supermarket you might see it and um, and I feel so bad for those yeah. parents. And I've been in that position before mm. where Aaron was having a complete meltdown mm. and having people stare at me while yeah. he screams and, and bangs his head and bangs mm. his ears. Mm. And it's because it, there's too much stimulus going on for him and his his little brain couldn't cope with it. Yeah. Um, and another thing that, used to make me really sad was um, birthday parties so when people would sing happy birthday he would just okay. have a complete meltdown right and I remember being at a party and the parents of the child whose birthday it was you know looking at me with disgust 
as if I was ruining their their kids' oh, magic moment when God. a birthday cake was coming out and everyone was sick, singing happy birthday. And Aaron was yeah. absolutely beside himself and, and banging his head, banging his ears, because he just, the noise. Too much. The light, yeah. It was too much for him. Yeah, so you do and need that understanding and education of, of friends, family. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen and it in the library them. myself. I've seen yeah. this um, happen. And you, you do see people kind of tutting or staring yes, or oh, you disgraceful, you know, and really I mean, that's the last thing a parent needs uh, is that judgment. Yeah. And again, we have we all have different expectations. I I remember um, there was one Christmas and my parents had bought Aaron a trampoline for Christmas and they were so excited and it was all assembled in the back garden, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And Aaron came out and he had absolutely no expression in his face. Yeah. Now, this was probably just in the early stages. Um, nothing, no joy. Mm. And my own family they were so disappointed yeah because they had an expectation that he would be you know absolutely over the moon but he wasn't yeah you know th- because he was actually more interested in the box yeah um yeah. and again he found it really difficult to play with other kids mm. at the time and i remember as a parent feeling absolutely heartbroken yeah We'd go away on camping trips and everybody else's kid would be off playing and enjoying themselves. And Aaron would be sitting in the tent with a a sweater over his head, just rocking back and forth. He was not able for it. He wasn't able for the stimulus. He's not able for that social interaction. And that's heartbreaking, I'd say, as a parent. It's heartbreaking. It was terrible. And I remember also I felt embarrassed because... Mm. I thought, why, why is he not like the others? Yeah. But in you know, as I, as he went through his own journey of therapy and support, I did with him as well. So yeah. I learned how to, as I guess, cope and adapt. And that's why it's so important for parents to get those supports and educate themselves because it helps you understand your own child. Yes, and it helps you move away from that sense of isolation. Yeah, yeah, and, and also from the yeah, and also from the, the, the again that perception we see so often in the media and ever that there's something wrong. As you said, yes, there's nothing exactly. wrong. It's to see your child. Yeah, that's 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 who he is. That's his his superpower. That's his yeah. There's difficulties, but superpower. that's that's who he is. That he just thinks a little bit differently to a lot of people, and that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. And it is. And it's also clear that social supports can ease parental stress. Mm. And this can be in the form of emotional support, either with family, friends, or other ASD families. Yeah. And also, as I said, getting informational support. And that can be found in the libraries, Barry, yep, it as can, you yep. mentioned. Um, at the schools as well, mm-hmm. or online communities are a great yes. resource. Um, yeah, can I just say on that? It, it, how important is it to maybe get to meet other parents? Uh, it's you with all of them. so important, so important. Just to even to you know have a cup of coffee with another parent and just ask, you know, is is this? Have you experienced this? Mm. Normalize it in a sense for yourself, but also that you're not alone and compare strategies and tactics that you've used. It's so helpful, but I think it's also just not being alone in it and having somebody else to bounce off. But also it's great to have, you know, play dates even with these parents because, well, and their kids because they get it. They yeah. know, and there's no joy there. Yeah, that's the key, isn't it? They mm. get it. They they understand, and also it's it's a space where you know there's not going to be judgment, because you're yes. people in the same in the same boat. You 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 understand each other, and and that event yeah. I was at, I had a lot of parents there who it was the first time they were ever meeting parents 
in the same boat as them and it was highly emotional a lot of them really had when they first met somebody says oh my god oh, you get it you get it i thought i was the it only one a very, yeah a very very lonely journey and mm. mm. um, it really can so it's so important to connect with others who understand your experience yeah or have that lived experience um, professional help is great, but there's nothing like, as I said, the lived experience. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and and growing number of studies also revealed Barry that mindfulness programs okay. can help reduce the additional stress experienced by parents of autistic mm. children. Um, and parents participating in mindfulness programs, they've reported decreases in stress and depression improvements in sleep and health yeah and also a big one is increased self-compassion so important and just yeah. a general overall feeling of well-being yeah and, um, and the, and the mind that you're, gone. you're yeah. doing a, a series of mindfulness aren't you at the, yeah well at the, the moment we're Rita. actually doing a yeah Rita O'Donovan we're actually doing a series on, yeah. on mental health in general a 12-week series we're doing it in Blanchetown and Malahide and mindfulness is definitely a big big part of that Rita is she's a real mindfulness guru we, we've had her in many times before with the adults with children as well the children were absolutely magnificent um doing the mindfulness they, they I remember they all greeted her with a namaste when she came into the room oh, were, and, and even now was... my son in he's in an educate together school and they do mindfulness now every week as part of their day in school, they're, they're taught how to do uh -huh. mindfulness. And I've often seen him on the couch doing his yoga positions. And, you know, and, and I see the benefits to him, like when he's playing football, he's getting a little bit wound up at a match. And I can see him on the pitch stopping and doing the breathing. And it's it's That's great. great. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have it to cost is. a fortune. Go on to YouTube. Um, I know there's Mark Williams has some fantastic mindfulness meditations. And some of them are as short as three minutes. Could be just a simple yes. breathing exercise. I love the body scans myself. You can do that in about 10 minutes. John Kabat-Zinn is another guy. He, a lot of his stuff is online. Uh, and he he has one body scan I love. It's about 40 minutes long. If ever you're really in the mood to, to do a big mindfulness session. And it's it's absolutely, it's, it's fantastic. So you don't have to pay a fortune for these things. And we have a lot of these books and CDs at the library as well. The John Kabat-Zinn ones, I know are all there with guided meditation. So, you know, definitely pop in and, and avail of those. And it is so important to try and be calm as a parent and um, particularly with a child on the spectrum um, because they can be particularly challenging. Mm. And I say that firsthand, Barry, because yeah. I understand that I get it. There's times when I just feel like screaming yeah. and running out of the house. Mm. And for me, you know, that only exasperates yeah. The child's condition and response as well because they can become then very fearful yes um, and the behavior then will escalate so what i find is i have to look after myself in order to look after my own child yeah with autism and to mirror he can you know to mirror that behavior just the sense of calm yes. and if i when he's being particularly challenging and now that he's a teenager, we have mm, all the hormones yep. added into that, that if he's escalating, I have to remain as calm as possible and speak mm. in a calm voice yeah. to just try and de-escalate him yes. and bring him yes. back down. Yeah. Um, so it's insight so important and looking after yourself. We don't have to be martyrs as parents mm. as parents um really don't yeah and so just uh, it's looking after yourself mm. yeah and, and like to finish on that i mean you've already mentioned a good bit of this any last tips you'd give for parents on looking after yourself on minding the mental health and you mentioned mindfulness already is there anything else you've mentioned yeah so raising a child with communication behavior challenges it's incredibly stressful 
but it doesn't have to sentence you to a life defined by stress. Yeah. And do your best to recognize when the pressures of your life are creating a chronic stress situation. Try and take the steps towards relieving the strain. And it, it not only will it improve your own health and happiness, but also benefit your child and in turn the entire family system. So yeah. if you can, take time out for yourself. Don't feel guilty. Mm. And just remember that you looking after you helps you support your child and to be the best version of you. So yeah. just to any parent out there um, and any parent, particularly with a child that's neurodivergent, just please look after yourself and know yeah. that there, there are supports out there. Yeah. Um, and just sending lots of uh, support to all of you out there. And, and, and the other thing I'll say is, for having oh, not at all, D delighted as always. And the last thing I'd say is, I mean, if it all does it get a bit too much, and this goes for anyone with a mental health issue, but specifically in this case, you know, don't be afraid to reach out for help and, and consider counselling uh, therapy yourself. And we might put your own details yes. under th this because I know you provide counselling and therapy and, and I mean who better to have a, an understanding of what a parent is going through th than, than you so I'll, I'll put your details underneath this as well but do, do reach out you know if it all gets a bit much and it's okay if it does it's okay yes that's you know there's, there's nothing there's no shame there's nothing wrong with that we we all get overwhelmed sometimes and having a child with autism I I, I can only imagine I'd imagine would be very overwhelming at times and you know, yes, so reaching out is fine. And it is. And maybe, Barry, on, on a footnote of that, you know, we can, if anybody has any questions yeah. or would like some further tips, mm -hmm. please feel free to email in. We leave some yeah. links and maybe we can do another podcast yeah. based on the back of that, Barry. Specifically, just yeah. Just to provide as much support as we can to parents out there. And it yeah. really is just about forming a community of support. Yes. And um, when we're connected, we feel we belong. Yeah. And I'm, and I can tell you now as well, uh, having just chatted with Rita O'Donovan, who's doing our, our mental health course, Rita herself has, has great experience in the area too. And uh, we are planning hopefully next year to possibly put together some kind of a course for parents. Uh, of a child with autism to, to maybe go into some of the detail and maybe you could play a role in that at some point we could we could beam you in Fantastic. one of the evenings to, to contribute as a guest speaker maybe or something like that and uh, oh, and, and hopefully that. provide a bit of support for for parents in the area so we we leave it at that that as ever was very enlightening very interesting very raw and honest at times which i really appreciate um, and I hope any parents out there or people out there with autism who are listening to this, that it, it helped them to know you're not alone, um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with getting help and early intervention is, is key. And you as a parent, you know your child more than anyone. And if you, you feel something yes. is a bit different, don't be afraid to act on it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Barry. And thanks to all our listeners.